Well, hey, you guys, welcome. We tonight are in Genesis chapter 9. I'm Lori Joyner. I'm thrilled you're here. We're in lesson 20, and um, I've titled our lesson tonight, even though we're going to be covering a lot of things, I've titled it The Rainbow Covenant. But trust me, we're going to cover more than just the rainbow uh, tonight. Because we're in our second to the last talk, I've got a lot to shove in tonight. I'm excited to cover it with you. Last week we saw in chapter 8 how Noah and his family exited the ark to a new ravaged earth after the flood. The landscape had completely changed, the atmosphere was different, and they would now forge a new existence together in this new, you know, ravaged land. And God had kept his promise to keep them safe on the ark. And Noah showed his gratitude by sacrificing a thanksgiving offering first thing stepping off the ark. So today, we're going to continue to trace what happened to Noah and his family after the flood here in chapter 9. We're also going to see how while you can take people out of a sinful, wicked environment, you're going to have a harder time taking the sin and the wickedness out of the people. The sin nature was still there, okay? So even though they were getting a fresh start, sin will once again affect their lives in the post-flood world. Today, we're going to look at the new way of life for mankind after the flood and a special covenant God will make with Noah and his descendants and the animals that come off the ark. We're going to see again how much God cares for animals. He's going to make a covenant with them, okay? It's very interesting. We will also get a glimpse at how Noah's lineage had some godly lines and not so godly lines. And further, we're going to see an interesting parallel between Adam and Noah. Okay? So, it's my hope that tonight is more than a history lesson, but a biblical lesson that we can apply to our lives today. So, let me pray, dedicate our time to the Lord, and then we're going to jump into our scriptures. So, Lord Jesus, we just thank you that your word is what's true. Not my words. It's your words that are true, Lord. We want to study your word, glorify you by learning about you and obeying your word. Father, I pray that you would use your word to light our path, to convict our hearts, and to help us glorify you on earth. And so, Lord, I pray that you would take your rightful place as master teacher Father, I pray that our lives would be changed because of our time spent in your word tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so on your outline, you're going to see that we're starting off with God instructs a new way of life. Genesis 9, and I'm going to start uh, verse 1 through 4. So let's read this. It says, Then God blessed Noah and his sons saying to them, be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground, and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. It says, then God blessed Noah and his sons. I do want to stop right there um, because we've got to think about the fact that this blessing is special. They have just endured not a hard year on the ark only, but actually a hard 75 to 80 years before that building the ark. Okay. I mean, let's just have a little bit of a recall. First of all, Noah was told that God would wipe away, that is, blot out all humanity and all animals with the breath of life in them. And so, certainly, Noah probably told his sons and their wives. And so, here's this group of eight, including Noah's wife, that know that a flood is going to come and everything we see will be gone talked about the fact that they had to carry that the entire time they're building the ark they they had to know in their heart a horrible thing was coming that's why they're building the ark 
So imagine if you had to hold in your heart some terrible news. And they were allowed to tell it if people wanted to listen. Okay? You had to drive down the street knowing that there's going to come a time that I'm not going to see that HEB where I get all my groceries. It won't be there. The elementary where my kids go to school won't be there. Every child enrolled in that school the year the flood comes will perish. Okay? My neighbors, my HOA, my friends, we all walk our dogs together. None of them are going to be alive. They're carrying a very heavy emotional burden. Think about the emotional burdens that you carry now or that you have carried. That's a weight. So this is not just a thing that God's told them. This is hard on the heart. Next, they were mocked probably for about 75 years. You're going to build this thing for what? What are you doing? You're crazy loon, you know. And, and the thing was probably hard work. I mean, you ever built, <laughs> built something? How about my husband and I this past weekend, we tore down an old falling apart pergola that our dog chewed up. And we're trying to build another one ourselves, okay? So I'm out hammering, drilling into the concrete. I mean, it's a lot of work. They did it for 75 years. They're working on this ark. Now, if you ever go to the Ark Encounter, you're going to learn that, that they probably had people helping them, hired help that they paid to, you know, do some of the things. Probably wasn't just his sons. They probably hired out, you know, created jobs. Um, and they lost everything except for what they could carry on to the Ark, okay? Their homes that maybe they decorated, the land they had cultivated, the flower beds, I mean, all of it you know, would be totally demolished. Their way of life, the people they traded goods with, their extended family. How about their wives' families? Their nephews and nieces didn't make it on the ark. We know that because we know that only eight people were on the ark. How about the fact that God shut the door and they, once that rain started, had to hear the wailing, the scratching, of people, of animals, their sounds. They probably, they probably couldn't sleep those first few nights after having to listen to that type of, of devastation. And so then they get off the ark to a ravaged earth where it's, nothing's the same and everything's ruined, basically. Nothing's where it was. And they're probably shell-shocked, like when a tornado goes through a town and you come out of the closet that you were hiding in and you don't even know where the street was. That's never happened to me, but we hear those interviews on TV. And so we know that the first thing Noah does when he exits the ark is to sacrifice to the Lord. And it says that God blessed him. Wouldn't you be happy for a blessing? After 76 years of what I just described? Wouldn't you just need to have a chill? <laughs> you wander off the ark and you're like, thank you for a blessing. So I don't want to rush past this. God rewarded them. God was with them. God blessed them. We would be happy for a blessing after that. We would thankfully receive a blessing. You know, I feel like the tough times that I've been through, I'm able to look back and say, okay, that was really hard. But I can point to ways that God blessed me after some of my storms, okay? Um, I've mentioned before uh, my many, many years of singleness. And I remember through tears, am I going to go through another Christmas alone? Remember, my two sisters were married. My youngest one was having kids. I've been in 11 wedding. <laughs> you know, when's it my turn to have a little bachelorette party? I mean, you know, and it would be tears and tears. Um, but here we are. I've been married for 17 years. And I'm just like, okay, Lord, you blessed me. I, I've not only been married, but I've got two wonderful kids from it. Uh, maybe some of you dealt with um, infertility. And you just remember the tears and the prayers and the journals. You've got stuff underneath your bed. And you remember. And now you look and you think, we somehow made it through the storm. God's blessed me with a child or maybe more. Maybe it was cancer. 
But you look at your life now and you say, I mean, I've got people that work out with me at the gym. They work out. They're more healthy than people that have never had cancer. And they're thinking, I feel so blessed. I got through a storm and God blessed me with health beyond other people that have never had cancer. Maybe it was debt. Maybe you were living paycheck to paycheck. And now here you are. I've got a friend posted on Facebook. how, And I remember going to her housewarming party nine years ago. She had gone through um, bankruptcy. And now... She owns her own home. And she said, nine years ago, I got to move in, and I'm just praising God today. God had brought her through that storm and blessed her. Not just, she's not just written something. She owns it. And so God blessed Noah. Let's just remember that he rewarded him. The storm was over, and God gave the blessing. But he also gave some new commands and some new promises and even a new way of living, even a new way of eating. Okay, so let's talk about that one command is the reiteration to be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Have we not heard that so many times? Did you ever think you would hear that term as many times as we've heard it from Genesis 1, 1 through Genesis 11 here? So God desires more humans. It's always been consistent and it's never changed. He wants more image bearers on earth. He wants more image bearers of himself. Okay? And also... Uh, oh, here, let's see. I forgot to put this one on here. God blessed them. Is that the first one? Yes. yes. Okay, thanks. See, I get excited. <laughs> so, God bless them. So anyway, um, but, but he wants more image bearers. Okay? And so, um, also Noah is given dominion over the animals, but with the difference. Now, Adam already had dominion over the animals. He was the one that got to name them. God delegated to him that authority and that role. But now, now the animals would be fearful of man. Okay, now just think about this. My friends, the animals have not been fearful of man. Remember how easily God was able to bring the animals to Noah? I mean, I'm sorry, to Adam to name? He wasn't having to, you know horse race out there and tie them up and, and hog tie them and name them. They were coming to him. Think about how easily the animals came to Noah on the ark. He wasn't having to lasso and yank them in there. Think about the dove. Flew out, came back to his hand. Okay, when's the last time you've been able to run outside your front yard and just catch a bird? <laughs> Let alone have it come back to you once you caught it. Okay, animals up to this point have not been fearful of mankind. But now God says they are, okay? Because he's also said that mankind can now eat the animals, but they're going to be harder to catch, okay? So it's kind of a twofold little uh, new way we're going to move forward here. So, um, you know, and when we think about like a deer in the wild, if they hear me, they don't come to me. They scatter, okay? You think about squirrels. They don't come to you. They scatter. And so recall that Adam and Eve and the animals were originally vegetarians, Okay, God had told them, I give you every green plant. But now he's changing the rules. God gives Noah all things. And from that time on, um, humans can eat animals. Now, I will tell you, there will come another time in Scripture where God's going to restrict their dietary guidelines again. And that's going to happen um, in the book of Leviticus, in the law. God's going to restrict their dietary laws, but for a purpose. He's going to then tell them certain things they can eat and certain things they can't eat and certain days they can eat and all this kind of stuff because it's going to set them apart from the godless people around them. It's going to mark them as a people because of what they will eat and because of what they won't eat. Now, I don't have time to chase that down today, but that's contained in the law. That'll come later with the law of Moses. But one detail that they must follow, and we read it, is that they're not allowed to drink the blood. And we're like, no worries. That's gross anyway. I promise you, I have no temptation to do that. But let's just understand that the animal is allowed to be eaten, the body, but not the blood. Okay. They could not and should not have blood consumed by animals because the blood represents the life and the life was given by God. So mankind can eat the body, but the blood is off limits. Blood cannot be eaten, okay? Because it represents life. Now understand, okay, really understand that blood is a big deal. Blood was shed when Adam and Eve were given animal skins to cover their nakedness in the garden. 
Okay, remember this? Blood was put upon the door of the Israelites' doorpost so that they would not suffer the last and final death plague that will sweep through Egypt uh, as the Israelites escaped. Jesus' blood was poured out on the cross as an atonement for our sins. And believers today, all over the globe, take the Lord's Supper, or some churches call it communion, where we drink juice. And, of course, some denominations use wine. But what's it a symbol of? Christ's blood. And recall that when we study Genesis chapter 4, God said to Cain, Abel's blood cries out to me from the ground. So understand, blood's a big deal all through Scripture, and we now know we're not allowed to drink it, and no thanks anyway. So God gives them new dietary rules, and he also gives them new civil rules. We're rolling into the very first uh, foundations of government. So let me read this first, and then we'll fill in the blanks. So I'm going to start with verse 5. God says, And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being, too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. So, the penalty for murder is given here. Death for death. God here is giving the foundation for civil government. Okay, so the first time we're seeing that he's saying to mankind, you can enact a punishment. Okay, it's been all God up to that point. He's been the one judging the earth. He's been the one judging wickedness. But now he's telling Noah and the future lineages, I delegate, I give authority to you for this. So a major role of government is to maintain law and order. And recall that when Cain killed his brother Abel, the Bible does not give any indication that there were any civil laws to deal with that. It was just kind of a family thing. Okay? Matter of fact, remember, God had to set a mark upon Cain so that people wouldn't kill him. There wasn't a government, a civil system set up at that point. Before the flood, the lack of capital punishment led to bloody vendettas. Remember Lamech? Remember Lamech in chapter 4 bragging about his murders? Okay, that's what was going on. And now, after the flood, God says, no more. I'm going to give you a way to deter this. So there are two aspects of this passage I want us to note. Number one, if an animal kills a human, the animal is to be killed. And we know this. This doesn't surprise us. We all know that when a dog attacks a person, it's pretty much always put down. I mean, I guess there are some situations where they'll just make the dog have a muzzle if it goes out in public, but most of the time the dog's put down, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and this will be reinstated later, actually. This isn't just a Genesis thing. In Exodus 21, 28, it'll say, when an ox gores a man or woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh cannot be eaten, but the owner of the ox is not liable. So if the, if the ox hurts a person, the ox will be put down. Okay, number two, the authority for capital punishment for murder is given. The willful taking of human life must be punished. There also has to be a way of ensuring a crime has actually been committed, because we know stories about that too. Our judicial system is, is fallen. We live in a fallen world. And we're going to see that explained in Deuteronomy 17.6. It will say, on the evidence of two witnesses or of three, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. So there is a safeguard that God gives in Scripture. So the death penalty is, we've got to understand, pre-political. Know other things that are pre-political like male female like marriage is between one man and one woman this is pre-political this is not you know a certain political party 
This is God, okay? And that's the, and that's the death penalty here. That's, that's what he's orchestrating. It was given by God and has never been revoked. By God's authority, a civil government can maintain civility and peace by protecting its citizens from lawless murder by implementing the death penalty. Now, this is interesting. In my studies of this, I came across a theologian, and this is what he said. Capital punishment is divinely ordained. For the proper safeguarding of the human race, this basic ordinance is laid down. When lawgivers attempt to tamper with this regulation, they're trying to be wiser than the, div than the divine lawgiver and overthrow the pillars of safety that God himself provided for the welfare of mankind. So anytime we go to tamper with this, we're saying we know better than our creator God. But why then? Why is murder the act that needs to be justified with the death penalty? God clearly gives us the reason why he hates murder and why it's worthy of death, and it has to do with his image. Okay, so let me just reread verse 6 here, where it says, Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed, for in the image of God, God has made mankind. So our argument is, this is an image bearer of God, and we are not to tear it down. When a person murders another person, that person extinguishes a revelation of God, a God image bearer. Murder is an assault against God himself, and thus has, has, he has delegated to us and civil governments to have recourse to stop it. Okay? So, think about the teaching of Genesis 9-6, okay, that we just went through, the image bearer verse, and how it would be applied to issues like euthanasia or abortion. In both instances, a deliberate action of taking a human life has happened. Our lives and the lives of other people belong to God. Okay? Each life and each stage of that life, whether it's the end of the life or the very, very tip beginning of the life, at, um, at conception, each stage of that, it is still, we are still image bearers of God, our Creator. We're not to extinguish an early birth. We are not to hasten a death, even later in life. Only God can do that. Except in the case of murder, which God has delegated authority to us. Okay? But there's another reason we're not supposed to commit murder. And that was stated in verse 1 today and in verse 7. And that is that God's command is to be fruitful and multiply and increase in number. So we, as a population, cannot be trying to decrease that we have to add our lives to that. We have to do everything we possibly can to help image bearers happen, not be extinguished or shortened. We're to be upholding that directive. We're to add people to the earth and not hasten or take people from the earth. So let me just pause here. And I've mentioned this before, and I know the statistics, that even in this room, there are women who have suffered the trauma of abortion. And I always like to remind people that God is a forgiving God. And when we come to him with true repentance, he will provide a way of healing. Matter of fact, in your resources, in the back of your um, curriculum guides, the very first line is a wonderful ministry called um, Rachel's Vineyard that is a retreat location that you can go and find real help and healing to heal from the trauma of abortion. But I would encourage you to go through the healing if that's you to get the help that you need. I spoke with a friend the other day that revealed to me that she's gone through the trauma of an abortion. I absolutely encourage her to please get healing for her own soul first and foremost, but also so that she can rise up from the inside out and be the voice that needs to be had in this culture about the dangers and the trauma of that choice. So let me move on. So we now know we have a new diet. We can eat animals now, but they're not going to be easy to catch. We have the beginnings of a civil government, right? We have the foundations of government. We have a prescription for the biggest issue, murder. And now we have a new covenant. So now let me read Genesis 9, 
um, 8, I'm going to go all the way to 17. Let's listen. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with, here we go back to the animals, every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. Okay? I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of the flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. Do you love how God repeats himself? Because we maybe didn't get it the first time or the second or the third. It's kind of like a child. You know, they didn't hear you the first time. Kind of like with my son, I have to remind him to put his retainer in like 20 times before we actually leave the house. Because the first couple of times, I don't know where he was in his mind. And I feel like God knows we're basically like that. So this is the first time the word covenant's used. Okay, have you heard that? I mean, we've been studying Genesis from 1-1. Have you heard the word covenant yet? No, this is it. All right. So this is the first time the word covenant is used in the Bible, and it just means a promise. It means a promise or a binding relationship. Here God makes an unconditional promise to animals and to mankind. He promises never to send a flood like the global flood of Noah's day, that would wipe out all humanity and animals again. So God said that from that point on, the rainbow is to be seen as a sign of the covenant. That whenever we see a rainbow, it will remind us um, that God will keep his promise. Okay? Are the blanks correct? Have I missed one? Okay. Which one did I miss? Image. Oh, thank you. So image is supposed to be the first blank? Oh, yes. There we go. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, so image here, and then right here is oh, promise. promise. Okay, thank you, my friends. Very good. So, I also love, and I put this verse in your notes, that Revelation 4.3 says a rank, uh, mentions that a rainbow is actually associated with the throne of God. Okay, it's so neat that the rainbow's here in Genesis. Rainbow's going to come back in Revelation. It says, He who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So, many things in Genesis span all the way through. But what is a rainbow? Well, I had to trace a rabbit trail here. So I went and got real technical and wanted to understand how do rainbows form? How are rainbows created? Rainbows are formed when light shines through water. So let me understand, let, I want you to understand that when you see a rainbow, it must be a lot of moisture in the sky or it's still misting or it's still raining because it's light reflected in water, okay? So I, I didn't know that. Did, did anybody else know that? I did not know that until I taught that this past year. So the light is bent, and I put a little picture for you guys. And when the light is bent through the little droplets of water, that's how you get the different types or grades of color um, of the rainbow. So the angle between the ray of light coming in and the ray coming out of the drops is 42 degrees for red and 40 degrees for violet and everything in between. So you can see the diagram in your notes. And, um, and it really just forms a circular rim in the sky, and there we get our rainbow. So I just thought they disappeared. I didn't realize they were a reflection through water. Um, 
So this covenant is a sign that reassures Noah that this isn't going to happen again. I'm not going to have to deal with that horrible 76-year journey again. Praise God. All right. He's not going to have to fear that every time it rains. Okay? Because he probably would. But I love the fact that it says that the rainbow isn't just for us to see. Because interestingly, in 916, God said, when I look upon the rainbow, did you see that? God's looking at his own rainbow. And he says, when I look upon the rainbow, I will remember my covenant. So again, God does not forget his covenants with people. We know that. But rather, it's just another way of assuring us that we don't need to worry uh, or be afraid. When we look on the rainbow, let me explain to you something. When you look at the rainbow, next time it rains, remember this verse in 9-6 that says God's looking at the rainbow. Because the rainbow becomes like a bridge between us and our Heavenly Father. It's a wonderful promise and a covenant, and it should warm our hearts. So the rainbow is a symbol that God will not destroy the earth with water again. Now, we know God will judge the earth again, but it'll be with fire. But I've already chased that down. So, um, life rolls on, and unfortunately, sin will creep back in. And sadly, we know that sin is always crouching at the door. So our next passage of scripture, I'm actually not going to read the whole thing. You can if you want. It's uh, Genesis 9, 18 through 29. But let me just tell you, it's a story. Let me just give you the gist of it. Noah gets off the ark, plants a vineyard. Okay? He drinks the fermented grapes, and he gets drunk, and he winds up naked in his tent. Okay? I just told you like all the verses. Ham goes in, sees that he's naked, runs and tells his two older brothers. The older brothers are like, oh my gosh, dad's naked in his tent. They get a cloak, they, hung, they hang on to it, they, they throw it upon their father backwards so they, are not, they don't see his nakedness and in thus respecting him and not disrespecting him. So Noah wakes up, obviously figures out, asks somebody what happened. He knows the story and he gets mad. And he curses not Ham, the son who went and blabbed about the dad's nakedness, but Ham's son, Canaan. Okay, and I'm going to explain why he did that. But let's understand that all humans today are descendants of either Shem, Ham, or Japheth. And once again, we understand that there's only one race, and that is the human race. And I'm going to chase that down really hard for it next week on the Tower of Babel. All humans are descendants of Noah, and of course we all also all go all the way back to Adam. But there's no different Races were all the human race. Now, some time has obviously passed, right? From when? when am I? Am I off again? Okay, tell me. Where? Where? Got you. Okay, so humans here. Thank you, thank you. Where is rainbow? Or what, what is supposed to say? Rainbow. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So listen, some time's passed. This isn't the day he gets off the ark, right? How do we know that? Because he's had to plant a vineyard. And then the grapes have had to grow, and then they've had to be fermented. But also there's another way we know. It's because his sons had a baby. Okay? So God did not say, you, your children, and your grandchildren get off the ark. So we know they had to get off the ark, and then now they're having a grandbaby. So there's been some time here, but whatever the time frame was, um, we know that um, this situation happened. We need to keep in mind that God's word doesn't hide the defects <laughs> of even the greatest of God's people. Okay. The Bible isn't scoured, okay? It's not scrubbed clean. God's word doesn't hide the defects of even the greatest of God's people. Reading the pitfalls of others helps us to know, and every one of us, to remember that we have a sin problem. Just like Noah, we have a sin problem as well. And the sins and the downfalls are left in Scripture as a warning to all of us not to do the same. We've discussed before that because the Bible has not been scrubbed clean of all the mistakes people made, it actually makes the document more trustworthy. 
because they didn't hide even embarrassing things. Shem and Japheth show great respect for their father in their action of looking away to cover the father. The fact that Ham didn't act the same way shows that he had a character problem. Okay, a problem that would affect his future lineage. Now, I um, studied the in the Wearsby Bible Commentary for a part of this lesson because I didn't understand really why is he cursing Canaan? I mean, it's Ham that messed it up. So this is what he says. How people respond to the sin and embarrassment of others is an indication of their character. Okay? Ham could have peeked into the tent, quickly sized up the situation, covered his body, saying nothing about the incident to anyone. Instead, he seems to have enjoyed the sight and told his two brothers about it, perhaps in a disrespectful manner. Okay, we don't know exactly how he said it to his brothers, okay? But we know kids, we know siblings. Hey, y'all should go check out that. You're not, you're not going to believe that, that, that the grapes did a number on that. I, we don't know exactly, but we do know that the brothers knew enough to quelch the situation, not make it worse. So Noah curses Canaan, but his son is Ham, the one that did the looking, but Canaan, the grandson, is the one that gets cursed. So, why did this happen? Well, after looking at several commentaries, this is where I landed after all the writing, and that is this. The commentaries seem to agree that Noah was looking down the lineage of Ham and seeing that his bad actions and his character flaws would most likely be continued. And don't tell me you haven't done it yourself in your mind. When you've looked at people that are like, let's say, criminals, and you think, if they don't, if they don't get their act together, their, their kids probably going to the same way. All right? Or you see an alcoholic, and they're letting their teenagers go get drunk, and you think to yourself, if they don't get their act together, it's, it's just going to continue. So here, it's more like a prediction. More like a, that's probably what's going to go down here. If you got this character flaw, that you're able to do this, it's, it's probably going to follow you. It's probably going to go down your line. And really, that's exactly what happened that Ham's line did become a cursed line. The Canaanites, they were the enemy of the Hebrew people. So, what we see now is that Noah was more predicting the natures of his three sons and how that they would most likely be uh, perpetuated in their descendants. The sin Ham committed would reverberate down his line. Well, a few weeks ago, I shared how Jesus was the ark of our salvation okay and how the ark was an incredible picture of salvation and how anyone who entered the door of the ark would be saved from this present world of evil and how when we enter by the door of jesus christ um, who also called himself the door we would also escape from this present evil world into heaven one day jesus himself recalls said i am the door Okay, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. But there's another comparison that I wanted to share with you before I left Noah altogether. Okay? So we know that Jesus compared himself to the door. Okay? Jesus even talked about Noah. He said, even in the days of Noah, this is how it will be. There's another comparison. I included it in your notes. And it's the comparisons between Adam and Noah. They're very strikingly similar. So check this out. This is in your notes under the heading Noah and Adam similarities. Adam was the head of the human race. Noah was the head of the human race after the flood. Both Adam and Noah are ancestors of all people in the present world. Adam was told to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the animals. And Noah and his family were told to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the animals. Adam sinned by eating forbidden fruit. Noah sinned by drinking wine made from the fruit. Adam saw his nakedness after sinning. Remember, in the garden. Noah's sin resulted in nakedness. God gave a covering for Adam's sin. That was the coat from the animal. Noah was provided a covering for his nakedness by his sons. 
God judged Adam's actions with a curse and a promised Savior. Noah's actions resulted in a curse and also a promise of a spiritual blessing through Shem. So, you know, there is um, a lot more we can say about Noah, and uh, but we've spent numerous weeks on Noah and the ark, so I'm going to wrap that up today. And I want to move on to something that's a little bit of a detour. It's some information I want to give you, but it could have gone this week or next week. And here's what it is. The Ice Age and the Stone Age. These events actually happened after the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. But they were triggered by the flood. So where am I going to put them? Okay. They started with the flood. But they happened in full effect after the Tower of Babel. So my friends, I flipped a coin. I'm putting it here today. Okay, I could have put it next week, but we have a lot to cover next week with Tower of Babel. So let me unpack this for us here. So we're in uh, number four, enter the Ice Age and the Stone Age. Now the Bible doesn't say, and then there was a Stone Age, verse chapter this, okay? It, it doesn't have that in there. Um, yet the Bible does give us the big picture of human history, as well as some critical details, which actually help us narrow down when the ice built up and when it melted away, okay? So the Ice Age was an event that happened after the Flood. And was triggered or generated by the Flood. Okay? At the end of the Flood. Okay, so this is what you've got to understand. At the end of the Flood, the water was warm. Okay? Let's talk about this for a minute. The oceans were warmer than they are now. Why is that? A couple of reasons. At the end of the flood, they were warmer because of the volcanic activity that happened during the flood. The Bible clearly states that there was eruptions from the ground up. Okay? We know that that resulted in volcanoes and ash going into the atmosphere. We know that there was lava that came out through that and went into the water. We know that there was movement of continents through the continental, uh, through the moving of the tectonic plates and the earth's crust broke open. We also know that the mountains were up thrust and the valleys went down. Okay, we studied this in scripture. So do me a favor here. Rub your hands together right now. Everybody, rub faster, 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 faster. What do you feel? What does friction do? Creates heat. So what's the friction doing as the tectonic plates are moving and the and tons of earth crust are moving up and down? We have a warmer water. So hold that in place. The warmer water would have resulted in a ton more evaporation of that water into the atmosphere. Okay? Just easier to evaporate. Think, think about steam. Okay, steam rising. You got heat rising off the water. You got a moist atmosphere. You got water in the atmosphere. Okay, and so that water, when it got cold, would turn into more snow and more ice. Okay, I'm from Oklahoma. We don't we have, we get snow, but we get something called you know sleet. You know sleet. Sleet's no fun. No fun to drive on. Black ice. Okay. So that's what you're getting. So think about the earth rotating. Here's our cold season. You're getting a massive amount of snow, sleet, and ice. Water's being evaporated up into the atmosphere. It's being deposited on land and it's freezing. Okay, but no problem, right? Because the earth is going to rotate. You're going to get the sun. But what's in the atmosphere? Volcanic ash. You've got eruptions of things that have come into the atmosphere so the sun's trying to come down and warm up and melt all the ice but it can't completely get through matter of fact it reflects back up into outer space okay so earth is still rotating here comes another cold season and we've got all this moisture and it wasn't melted away so you get another sheet of ice on top of the ice no worries here comes the summer again but again we can't get it all the way melted and there you have the ice age you have compounding upon compounding upon 
compounding. And of course, we know that there's some places on earth that are just naturally colder anyway. Okay, so you have the ice age. So I actually drew a little, I was trying, I was gonna draw you a picture today. And this is just the most stupid little picture. But this is fire flames coming off of water. I was doing this at my desk trying to make myself understand it. This is the moisture in the sky. And, um, and I've got the sun can't come down and I even drew a little um, snowman. <laughs> but the, the bottom line is, is that it couldn't, um, it couldn't melt and it compounded the problem. So let me read this. The ice would have built for several years, causing large ice sheets and glaciers to form. You've got glaciers in the water and you've got ice sheets on land, okay? Places that are naturally colder, like those in the far north and the far south of the earth, are places that the ice age affected the most, okay? It wouldn't have affected Texas as much as it would have affected Canada. Do we understand that? It's just naturally colder up there. The ice sheets extended downward, okay, uh, from the north in Asia, Europe, and North America. It covered most of Canada and the northern United States down as far as Illinois, Ohio, and Indiana. In Europe, it extended down over most of northern Europe, like Sweden, Norway, Finland, and most of England. In Asia, it covered large parts of Russia. So, evolutionary scientists assert that there were many ice ages over millions of years. But this isn't true. The ice age was after the flood. It peaked and retreated during its duration. So since the ice age finally peaked, it's been melt melting ever since. We're living in the melted time. It's still melting, okay? So massive sheets of ice, some pieces of it still exist, but it's melting and it's reducing in size in most locations. But my friends, there are some places and really cold places that it's still growing because the sun still can't get through for other issues we know in our atmosphere, okay? So like Greenland and the Arctic ice cap, these places help give us an idea of what it was like when the ice age was growing over the earth. So scientists can actually um, study the growth of that in those really cold places. So you cannot have an ice age until you have the flood because you don't have the friction and the heat of the water nor the blockage in the atmosphere. And that's how it came to be. Then you have ice age humans. Another interesting development during the Ice Age was the appearance of Neanderthal people. People. Like all other humans, they were descendants of people who were scattered after the Tower of Babel. Their short, squat bodies were better suited for the cold than the taller, thinner bodies of other people groups. The Neanderthals used heavy spears to hunt woodland animals, but these woods began disappearing at the height of the Ice Age because the ice was moving, coming down, building over years and years and years. So what do you have? You have habitats being ruined, you have animals becoming extinct, you have food sources depleting. So, um, but as the Ice Age continued and as ice sheets grew over the land, um, they were just, the land was ruined. It just became a grassland. Everything was frozen or just a barren tundra. So Neanderthal people, they were people that were scattered from the Tower of Babel. They are descendants of Noah and Adam. They're not some other random people that were created later. How about Ice Age animals? The animals that lived during the Ice Age in the areas between the ice, okay, they can't actually live on the ice. They gotta go find food somewhere. So these animals that lived around this uh, were well equipped to handle the cold. Handle the cold. Such as furry animals and warm blooded mammals. Now, there are many animals that would do well um, during this time period, but there's famous ones, right? There's the saber toothed cat, the woolly mammoth, the giant beaver, the snowshoe hare, the short-faced bear, and the great mastodon. So there are some famous 
animals from this time period. Many of these have gone extinct, which we understand. They were either hunted or they lost their habitat because of the Ice Age or they lost their uh, food source. At the Creation Museum, so the Creation Museum by the Answers in Genesis Ministry, they actually have a replica that I've seen of the third largest complete skeleton of a mastodon ever found. And it has flint markings on its ribs from spears and arrowheads, which help us understand that there were hunters and they were actually able to kill these massive animals. So the big ice age uh, mammals are not new kinds of creatures. Okay, so they're not new. They didn't appear. They're merely larger variations within the original kinds that God created on day six of the creation week. And larger variations within the beasts of the field uh, that were also preserved on the ark. So animals came off the ark and the ones that had wool and were larger and warm blooded would have survived here better than other ones. So we understand that. So sometime after the demise of the Neanderthal people, the first Stone Age villages began appearing all over the world. And these villages are found in the thousands. In some instances, they're spread over several acres. And it's called the Stone Age because it's characterized by when humans, sometimes referred to as cavemen, okay, so this blank is cavemen, started using stone, such as flint, for tools and weapons. They also used stones to help start fires. Now this is really sad. Cavemen are viewed as primitive brutes in the evolutionary worldview. But in a biblical worldview, they're just humans, descended from Adam and Eve. They're just humans. These people lived in the harsh post-flood world of the Ice Age. They used caves for shelter and made simple but effective tools as they traveled and hunted game. They should not, listen, they, these people should not be looked down upon as stupid brutes, okay? But more applauded for their resourcefulness, perseverance, and ability to survive the harsh conditions I just explained. The, the receding waters of Noah's flood would have carved out many caves, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's sad to me that they're looked at as just like a stupid brute carrying a big club when you're like, these are survivors. They were resourceful. They're able to kill these massive animals that you can't even wrap your brain around. They're able to create tools. We know even before the flood, they were creating tools and, and even weapons. We know that from Lamech's line. But here's the thing. The Bible has cavemen in it. Did you know it? In Genesis, we find that Lot was once a caveman after he fled Sodom in Genesis 19.20. When David was running from King Saul, he lived in a cave. In 1 Samuel 22.1, Obadiah hid a hundred prophets in a cave and fed them bread and water to save them from Jezebel in 1 Kings 18.4. To escape the Midianites, the Israelites lived in temporary caves in Judges 6-2. Elijah himself lived in a cave in 1 Kings 19-9. Even Job mentions people who lived in caves in Job 36. So from the viewpoint of biblical history, as people spread out after the confusion of the languages at the Tower of Babel that we're going to get into next week, they would have constructed various homes to live in. Okay? They're not all staying in one central place. They've got to go find a new place to live. So they're living in temporary huts, uh, mud huts perhaps. Maybe they're making little lean-tos. They're staying in some types of dwellings made of stone or wood. And you know what? If I found a cave, I'd probably just move into it. Wouldn't you? If you had to go camping and it's raining, would you rather be in your tent or in a cave? Oh, you're a caveman? <laughs> okay. They're just being resourceful. If someone asked me, oh, you believe in cavemen? I'm going to be like, well, if you would, if you mean cavemen by people who lived in caves, well, I guess so. I mean, they're in the Bible, so 
Anyway, this, it just fires me up because they're just looked at so down and, and stupid when actually they're just so resourceful and survivors. But that's what the evolutionary worldview will always do. They always try to make monkeys out of people. They always try to dumb us down. And, um, and instead, God made humankind to be extremely imaginary, resourceful, and um, uh, with a fully functioning brain. They would be able to figure this out. So anyway, I've given you many other links and resources. You see a great map there. I'd like for you to look that map up. Um, if you'll flip in your notes, a, a great map of the, uh, and a timeline of the Ice Age and, and the, listen, the Ice Age, one thing you just gotta understand is that there were so many big sheets of ice, you could walk on them from continent to continent. Mm -hmm. So when you're wondering, how did those animals get there? They were walking on the ice. They were just walking from one continent to the next. Well, no, that had to be millions of years and blah, blah, blah. No, you, just, you get yourself a good ice age right after the flood and those animals are just walking along, okay? It didn't have to be anything special. So if you will look up that map, I gave you the link and the resources, look it up on a computer so you can blow it up and read some of those things that you look like you need like a magnifying glass to look at. Just look it up on a computer, but because it, it's really interesting and you can tell my passion about this, um, but we only have a certain amount of time. So one last thing before I close this in prayer is this. I've only given you homework one time in the 21 weeks of our, of our journey, but I've got to do it one more time. I need you to read chapter 10 on your own. I'm not going to discuss it at all because here's the thing. Do you remember how Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 go together? You remember how Genesis chapter 2 is a double click of Genesis chapter 1? with an emphasis on Adam and Eve, that's 10 and 11. They go together the same way. They're like layered on top of each other, okay? One explains the other and the other explains the one. So I don't have time to cover two full chapters. I need you to read chapter 10 on your own so that when we come in here for our final lesson next week, you're gonna be able to jump right into chapter 11 with me. Okay, let me pray for us tonight. I know I've given you a ton to think about I might have blown your mind a little bit. Let me pray for us, and then we'll have some discussion questions. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that um, we don't have to believe in evolution. We can just read your word and have simple, logical answers to many of our questions that we face today. Thank you that your word is true. So if something arises that does not correspond with your word, then we just automatically know it doesn't need to be trusted. So, Father, I thank you that you've given us your word as a guide. Um, thank you that science does not contradict the Bible. Uh, in fact, it, the Bible informs science. I thank you that you, you're a scientist. You created this. You've given us the joy of discovery. So, Lord, thank you so much for all that you've given us and the many ways that you've blessed us, just as you blessed Noah. And so, Father, I pray that you would find glory in our learning of your word and our explaining it to others, including our children and future grandchildren. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys.